I'm recording again. Uh, when it's 132 degrees, it actually died because it had 1% battery power. And so I'm signed into the account again, into Mac. 141 degrees, look at that, 141 degrees. These are all screenshots. Hotshot computer, like hotshot phone, 147 degrees is a CPU, gmail.com, 147 degrees, and I have a pen in here. And Gmail is taking a while to load right there. And it is 96 degrees. 96% uh, battery power, 142 degrees on 141 on the MacBook Pro, 145 on the now I'm going to go down here, quick time is already open, I'm going to go here, file, new screen recording, my email is coming up, 145 degrees on the phone, this is score, I'm going to start recording, Ah, uh, this is the long, lengthy recording. Save. Oh, I thought I already saved it. I did save it already. Did I not? Okay. Save it now. Title untitled. Untitled already exists. Um, I thought. Name it hot. Save it. And I am recording there in the menu bar. Okay, so we should be saving. I'm going to go down here. I think. I think things might be working. Maybe not. So I click on Word to open that document for Cora. And this, uh, this is what's happening. 145 degrees on the phone. Crazy, crazy hot phone. And 184 degrees uh, in the 6. 86. 185. 86 now. 187 on the MacBook Pro. Okay, and let me see here. My computer will open the Word document. So it's not focusing, but water jumping up and down right there, right there. Oh, 145 degrees. Take a screenshot of that. Oh, can not get it. Right, water jumping up and down, but it will not open. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to minimize my email. Minimize it. And these are all screenshots. And like I said, I'm working on the core document. 145 degrees on the phone. And what document does not want to open? There's the Word document right there. So they need it. There's the Word document, and there is Word in the doc. And Word will not open.
Nope, it didn't open. And I hear the fan coming on. It's 182 degrees. Word will not open. Okay, I clicked on it again, and I am going to do Apple. Four clip. 147 degrees on the phone, and Microsoft Word is not responding. Good, and I'm going to full script. Full script. Microsoft error reporting. Full script. Full script. Good. This time seems to be working. I can hear the fan coming on. We'll try word again. Word is bouncing. 147 degrees on the CPU and it says Microsoft Word there on fourth script. Okay. So let me see if I can open the Cora document or the document for Cora. Microsoft is not responding again. And I close it. And I close script. So it's going to be a long night trying to get the questions to Cora because ain't nothing working. So if I see it again. Good. So that's what I have working. I'm going to go back here to work. Try one more time to open. One. Click one. Hundred and forty seven degrees the CPU which which is amazingly hot. Hundred and thirty eight is the battery. And I am on question number 17 uh, in the um, in the document in the word document. Uh, so it is not responding again. Good. 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 Obviously, what is not working? I am going to go to. This is still being saved. This is the recording of me typing up this document. Me typing this document, the word document. That's in that recording. In this recording. 145 degrees. The line just came on. So me typing of the word document is there. It's titled doc. No hot. And it is there. Hot. Yes, I know I have a lot of uh, screenshots on the screen and some recording. But they are there for me to get organized for this word document. Alright. So. Here's my email. I'm going to go plus. Compose. S I S U. Right there. Word. Okay. And there it is. And there is the Word document. And I'm going to do that. Look at that. The file is zero bytes. 
How can the fall be zero bytes? This is crazy. Somebody doesn't want me to post these questions. Okay. The file is not zero bytes. Hold on. Oh my god, look here. The file is empty. I just went to get info. Zero KB. Today, 7.52 p.m. Microsoft Word document. Zero bytes on disk. That is amazing. That is not true. Somebody screwed around with my with my Word document. That's why it's not opening. Now here's hot. Let's play hot. Here's my Word document number four. Wait. Number fourteen. Number sixteen. Question number sixteen. Okay, question number sixteen. And question number 17, right there, okay, number 17, continue, 147 degrees on the phone, alright, and so I go to the end, there's my word document, right here. I'm going to play. One forty five degrees on the phone and there it stopped. So QuickTime stopped on its own accord. I did not stop QuickTime. And I saved this document, the Word document, but it is empty. <laughs> My Word document is empty. There's nothing in it. I've said this so many times. My evidence keeps disappearing. So I can't send the Word document to myself. There's nothing in it. Let's quit. Microsoft Word is there. And yes, it's not responding. Got it. Why? Because it's empty. How did it become empty? How did it become... Oh, I'm going to close that. Alright, so the Word document is empty and I'm going to have to redo the entire thing. It took me a couple hours to get all the images and everything together. Now I have to redo it. Alright, so here I am. 
I am going to go here. Go here. 147 degrees. So, you too. Crazy hot phone. My channel. 143 is the last one. So, the very top one here would be 144. Nope, the one we need. Okay, four or four. Question 34 calls. Forty seven degrees is the TPU one forty one Fahrenheit is the battery.
I'm gonna leave this for a moment and go here to the computer. The fabulous computer. So here is that ah this is a new recording. This is the recent one. That's okay. I'm gonna go back here. And go back to my channel. taking a long time the video is only 15 16 minutes and this is taking a long time now i don't need to write go here 147 degrees fahrenheit there you go I'm back to Tyler for a moment. We both had these, as you say, these um, outsized dreams as teenagers. And then we both actually realized them. Yeah, it's very strange. And I know I was a dreamer, and I'm sure Tyler is. But the NHL, oddly enough, because of my small stature and dislocating shoulder, it put things in perspective. So the goal was to get a, a U.S. scholarship. And I tell parents that now. You shouldn't be dreaming about the NHL. It's a minuscule percentage of guys who make it you should hope that your child goes to college and is a student athlete and gets the most out of it if they're good enough they'll make the nhl you already mentioned that tyler was extremely excited when he went to the maple leafs and you actually write about that as well in your book here's how he put it 
from a huge trauma at the extent for better or worse when the victim died with the team. And when my good buddy from high school was not only on the team, but, you know, one of the reasons why they were doing so great and almost made it a couple of times to the Stanley Cup final because of him. And I was always there at the game, in the room. We were really in touch in those days. It was really, it was so awesome to be like that connected. The Leafs are part of every Toronto team hockey fan. They live and die by the Leafs. But when you're, when you're buddy, is a huge part of that. It was just like the greatest thing ever. What was it like for you coming on with Nick Leafs? Yeah, it was, uh, it was a little scary at first. If you were going to bomb, it was going to be a big time bomb. But it, it added a new level of intensity to your focus and to your to your game. It was never you couldn't take a practice off, you couldn't take a shift off, you couldn't take a day off. And um, I remember those four years, I was uh, all in and and uh, like I always was. But just the, the magnitude of media coverage, especially in the playoffs, it was a hundred times uh, what the regular season was. But it was just intense pressure. And you know, to hear the now about it. It was a great time and I felt very important and um, he made me feel important but uh, I was always guarded definitely I was guarded in my life my personal life my questions my answers everything that probably was the most boring interview you could possibly listen to which is fine because you don't want to give anything away you know that's just you never show weakness never give anything away and that's how I lived especially those Toronto years give the most boring interviews ever when they come <laughs> to the game. Talk to them when they're retired. It's exactly. a real human. We have to wait for this. Um, but being in the NHL, there are a lot of peaks, obviously, but there are some, some valleys, too. And we'll just bring in Tyler one more time because he felt he could relate. The music business is similar. The tremendous highs of the sporting world and, and professional sports, it's very similar to music where you know, there's years where we won tons of Junos, or we were nominated for Grammys, or we had number one singles, and sold out tours all over the place. And then there's other years where you release two albums and don't even get invited to the Junos. There's ups, the downs, that kind of thing. And, you know, Curtis has been through them too, like getting traded and going out to Phoenix and, uh, you know, having his career uh, come to an end without winning a Stanley Cup. You know, there's those disappointments as well. But what you realize is that the ride is so exciting. What's it like on that ride as a professional athlete when you start getting closer to the end of your career than the beginning? So you're transitioning now to the backup role when you were once the rising star. You have to adopt an attitude that's going to work. If you don't, you're just going to be miserable. So when I, when the league stopped calling for a number one goalie, which made sense. Who wants a number one goalie that's 38, 39 years old? Nobody. It doesn't make sense. So uh, I adopted an attitude that worked, and I became a backup for my last couple of years. And uh, you know, I embraced that role, and I think I was a, a good uh, backup. I tried to be a good friend and a good teammate uh, to the number one goalie. You've been retired now for almost a decade. Yeah. And what's it been like now stepping away from the game? Certainly, the first few years are always tough, and I've talked to other guys in other sports, and they'll tell you the same thing. I think part of that is that you think you can still play. Those are still your friends out there, and you're important to them. But, you know, father time, like they say, and I love this quote, is undefeated. And uh, so true. But after you get by that first three or four years, um, uh, you understand that life goes on, and you're going to be retired a lot longer than when you were playing. Well, thank you, Curtis Joseph, for sharing your story and for coming in today. Thank you very much. It's been, uh, it's been great. Curtis Joseph played in the NHL for 19 seasons, including for the Toronto Maple Leafs and Calgary Flames. He's the author with Kirstie McClellan Day of the memoir titled Cujo, The Untold Story of My Life on and Off the Ice. He was with me in our Toronto studio. You're listening to The Current Review on CBC Radio 1. I'm Michelle Shepard. This morning I watched President Obama talking about Gitmo, right? Guantanamo Bay. Which, by the way, which, by the way, we are keeping open. Which we are keeping open. And we're going to load it up with some bad dudes, believe me. We're going to load it up. That was Donald Trump on the campaign trail in 2016. And true to his word, once he became president, he quickly shut down an office in the State Department 
that was charged with closing the facility. But it turns out that move had some unintended consequences. The office was called the Special Envoy for Guantanamo Closure, and part of its job was to find countries that would accept detainees. But it was also responsible for tracking them after they left the prison. And now it seems several of those former detainees are missing, or at least the U.S. has lost, lost track of them. That's according to a new investigation by Carol Rosenberg. She's a reporter with McClatchy, owner of the Miami Herald, and she's been covering Guantanamo since 2002. That's where we've reached her. Hi, Carol. Hi, Michelle. Can you tell us who these detainees are who are now missing? There's a number of them, but I think possibly the most important ones that come up in our research is a Syrian man, uh, a hunger striker, and thorn in the side to the prison here, who was resettled in Uruguay during the Obama administration, ran away, and my Syrian sources tell me he's now in South Central Turkey going in and out of al-Nusra controlled um, Syria, uh, Idlib province. Two other cases involve two Libyan men who were sent to Senegal. They were afraid to go home. After two years in Senegal, something went wrong, apparently, with U.S.-Senegalese relations, and the Senegalese put those two men on a plane, one of them against his will, in what appears to be a diplomatic gap, the full month, and sent him back to Libya, even though he said he thought he'd be killed there. And in that first case that you described, this seems like it would be the U.S. administration's worst nightmare, that somebody who's been detained by U.S. forces is now possibly in a country where there are U.S. troops. And given that, why was he or other detainees released in the first place? The Obama administration was trying to close Guantanamo. The Obama administration was trying to mitigate the um, anger and um, the problems they had with these war on terror detainees who could never be charged with a crime, who were no longer of any use to the Americans, but they weren't convicted of anything. So they searched the world and tried to find places, far flying places, far from the battlefield, to send these men to start new lives in new countries. And so, yes, this is their worst nightmare, potentially. This man should never have been allowed to get anywhere near Syria. That's what the former Obama administration ambassador who made the deal and kept track of it tells me. The Obama administration went out of their way to make sure that man never got near Syria. They kept ties with the Uruguayans. They, when he would run away, they made use all of the resources of Americans, including the intelligence community, to get him back. The Trump administration comes in, dismantles the office that trapped these people, and he vanished, apparently, to turn up in Syria. And the problem, Michelle, is that they went out of their way to make sure these men didn't return. They say to the battlefield, but really to places where there are American forces, U.S. soldiers, because this man, for example, he was a hunger striker, and he came back to hate the Americans, hate the American troops, because they put him through these, you know, forced feedings. And so he was going to be angry. So they tried to find like the farthest place, safest place possible for him to start a new life in Uruguay. They wanted to make sure these guys didn't go near the places where the U.S. continues to be at war. And you've mentioned Uruguay, Senegal. What other countries accepted these former detainees? It was a pretty amazing um, effort. They found 30 different countries to resettle them. Uh, as you know, they went to Palau. They went to El Salvador. They went all across Europe, including places like Slovakia, Hungary, Serbia. They sent many men to resettlement in the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, which turned out to be less of a resettlement plan because they're now, as we've learned, uh, in more like and have been given the opportunity to leave that and start the new lives as the Obama administration intended. And that office that has now been closed, would they try and uh, diplomatically arrange those deals with them to ensure, say, that they don't go into another prison? Is that also part of their mandate? For sure. They weren't supposed to be, they were supposed to be trying to figure out a way so that there wasn't a continuing problem. 
You know, it was called the Office uh, of the Special Envoy for the Closure of Guantanamo, but in addition to closing Guantanamo, they tended very closely to these um, transfer deals because while Obama sent about 200 men away, George Bush sent about 550 Guantanamo detainees from the prison. And what they found out is that if they didn't keep an eye on these deals, if they didn't fashion very individual, almost like social service remedies for them, some of them did return to the battlefield during the Bush administration. So the Obama administration looked for small, far-flung countries to take just a few to, with the hope that they would settle there. So we've requested a comment from the U.S. State Department, but so far we've not heard back. I understand that perhaps not uncommon. You faced the same problem when you were doing your story. Now that the Office for the Closure of Guantanamo has itself been shut down, who is responsible for tracking former detainees or, or answering these questions even? They moved it to the Office of Ambassador Nathan Sales. His office is the counterterrorism office at the Department of State. So he's supposed to be working on, um, you know, building relations with countries over counterterrorism uh, joint activities. And as need be, you know, reaching out to countries that are violators. It's not that it doesn't make perfect sense, but what happened when they just met with that office is it took some lawyers and the diplomats who had experience making the deals in the first place, and they sent them to other offices. So what it is is they now have brand new staffers, uh, Trump appointees, trying to catch up and manage these deals that went untended for at least a year. And Carol, you're there this week. Uh, you continue to cover Guantanamo, but it really feels as if it's been fallen out of the headlines elsewhere. Why is it still an important story? My editor made a decision back in 2002 that if the U.S. government and the U.S. military was going to build a prison and courthouse out of reach of the American people, it would not be out of reach of American journalism. My editor decided that somebody has to come down here and tell the story of Guantanamo because otherwise it would be forgotten. It is forgotten, mostly, but we're just covering it for those who still want to know that it's here. Carol, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you, Michelle. Carol Rosenberg is a reporter with McClatchy, owner of the Miami Herald. We reached her in Guantanamo Bay. We also requested comment from the Republican chairs of the House and Senate committees with responsibility for Guantanamo. They declined comment or did not reply. So now that the State Department has closed... All right, so I'm waiting for a thumbnail to show up. And the thumbnail has no time. The thumbnail is missing time. Okay. I'm gonna Play it. All right, so this is the Word document. I'm going to cancel it here. Um, I want All right, so this is the Word document. I'm going to cancel it here. Um, I want to save it. I've closed 17 questions. Mm -hmm. And 
so it, it is there and what I'm going to do now is I am going to stop recording this S has to be at the end of this video